This episode is sponsored by Horizon Capital, an M&A and micro private equity firm that acquires and grows SaaS companies. Horizon Capital only works with SaaS companies generating between 500K and 5 million in annual recurring revenue, where they help them unlock the true value of their business and scale to the next level. Whether you're ready to move on to your next startup or want to work with the right growth partner, Horizon's team will work with you to find the best structure possible. From M&A strategy to capital investments, SaaS is all they do. Simple as that. If you're a SaaS founder with less than $5 million in annual recurring revenue and are looking to sell your business, visit horizoncapital.com today and get a free valuation. If you'd like to sponsor the SaaS District podcast or recommend any guests that you think would be valuable to be on the show, visit horizoncapital.com slash SaaS dash podcast today. Thanks again, folks. Hello, hello, everyone. This is your host, Akil Jabbar, and welcome back to another episode of SaaS District. In today's episode, we'll be talking about from a startup to acquisition and how to derive value with marketing attribution. Today, we have our guest, Max Creamer, joining us. Max is an entrepreneur, technologist, and the previous co-founder of Datastay, which is an on-demand web PLM software for SMBs, which then got acquired by Autodesk. He is now the co-founder and CTO of TrialFire, which is a customer intelligence and web analytics platform that removes the barriers to being data-driven and always on on data science. Uh, He enjoys talking about startup success and failures, as well as methods to measure consumer engagement, what to track, why, and how to get those metrics quickly and easily. So welcome, uh, Max. Super excited to have you on SAS District today. Glad to be here, Akhil. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. So um, obviously, let's start off as usual. What we like to know is, you know, can you share a little bit about your personal background? What were your past ventures? And then what was your core motivation after you exited your first company to launch your now company, which is TrialFire? Okay, so um, my background is uh, on the tech side. Um, I, you know, I graduated from York University with a degree in computer science, um, and uh, worked for a number of different companies. But was immediately drawn into these this world of startups. Um, my first uh, exposure to that was when I moved out to Chicago. I worked for. Uh, one of the first vo- voice over IP providers called go to call and um, go to call was really interesting. They, they, they penetrated the market by first publishing um, the, the telephony rates. Right? So you're calling from us to any other country and you can look up different providers and see what they're charging. So right. they generated a lot of traffic like that. And then they, launch their own service. So they, that's how they built an audience and then launched their own voice over IP service. Um, that was a great success. They were acquired by uh, Delta 3. And uh, then I moved back to Toronto and I joined another startup called Ocean Lake Commerce. Okay. And that was a total flop. And, <laughs> and you learn as much from the failures as you do from the successes. So Absolutely. So, Back then, I don't know if you remember the days of like black and white mobile phones, um, like the old Nokia's. The flip ones? Yeah. Yeah, Web web browsing was like non-existent, right? We didn't have browsers the way we have, you know, mobile browser now. Um, so it was all black and white and, and we built sort of this transcoding engine that would take any, any regular laptop or wired site and transcode it to uh, uh, WML, what wireless markup language, which was like back then that was um, uh, kind of the bridge between HTML and and phones, right? So we had some traction there. We had um, we had a one of our best customers was the shopping channel. And uh, we built this like mobile experience that users can see products while watching Shopping Channel and buy in real time on their phone. Mm-hmm. But it's um, 
that technology was easily disrupted disrupted by by the evolution of mobile devices, right? So yeah. obviously you don't need something like that anymore. It was kind of like the cassette era, right? Between records mm. and 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 CDs, right? So um, that that eventually kind of flopped, mm -hmm. and uh, I went to work for uh, a couple other. Uh, large corporate companies that did some works work um, in online banking, and um, and then eventually started Data Stay. Okay, and then what was that? So you were working in banking, and then it was it just on, like on the side you were kind of building this on the side while working, or did you quit your job and, and go focus? Uh, I was I was doing it in parallel. Yeah, mm, yeah, nice. it was a long time ago, so I'm trying to remember all the details. <laughs> and, sure. And, and my um my my co-founder at that time, Mike. Um, you know, gave me this idea. He 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 was building, he was making CD ROMs for automotive, um, like low down in the supply chain for for automotive parts manufacturers, mm -hmm. like a CD catalog of their products. Right, and um, they were having all these problems, like maintaining. Uh, the, the integrity of their product data and uh, the, the, they didn't really have a change management process. So they had CAD drawings that weren't aligned with, with what, what the part actually looks like, things like that. The revision history, there was not really um, comprehensive software to manage it. People were doing it in Excel and Word docs. It was a mess. Mm -hmm. So he built like, something for uh, a company called Federal Mogul. So I don't know if you know Federal Mogul, but I'm sure yeah. you've heard of like Champion Spark Plugs and they, they, sure. they, they, that, that's the umbrella company, Federal Mogul. And they, they have a whole bunch of automotive brands. Okay. Um, and he built something in, in uh, ASP for them to, to manage their um, product numbers. Mm -hmm. And uh, we looked at that and we're like, well, how can we make this generic? How can we make this a system for any group of engineers that needs to collaborate over um, a bill of materials and change management process and a set of CAD documents and version control, how can we make that available? And we realized we were competing with like IBM and Dassault and like these huge companies and they were selling these tremendous multi-million dollar software packages. Mm -hmm. and, and back then, this is the emergence of SaaS, right? So we're like, okay, well, We'll just have a have a have a web app, and we'll make it multi-tenant. And right. and um, and now you know no, no one does big software packages anymore, and it's all uh, wow, SaaS is yeah SaaS is yeah. the is the de facto standard now for software delivery. So so mm -hmm. that's how we started. Was 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 um, back then it was called PLM Product Lifecycle Management, mm -hmm. and uh, we started playing in that space, and. Um, we got a bunch of customers because the, the mid market was wide open. They couldn't afford the IBM solution. Right. Right. Yeah. So nice. um, we got a lot of great customers. I loved working in that space because I got to visit some of these clients and see their factories. And um, I was always sort of like an engineering nerd. Mm -hmm. um, in, in my spare time, like I take apart motorcycles, put them back together, build choppers, things like that. So, so that was, that was really cool for me. And, cool. um, we got Autodesk's attention because we were using various browser plugins to display some of their proprietary mm -hmm. CAD files. So they were like an integration partner at that point, would you say? Something kind like of, yeah. kind of, sorta. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then they're like, yeah, we want to buy you guys. Nice. They so they approached you. Did they know like how how big you were, or were you just getting their attention from how much volume you were bringing to them? Or do you remember that? Um, yeah, we were pretty transparent with them about our size and the number of customers, and and they didn't really buy us for our customers. They bought mm -hmm. us for two reasons. Okay. It was the technology mm -hmm. and the 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 SaaS or cloud-based service delivery mentality, right? Mm -hmm. We we kind of in not we were one of their first SaaS acquisitions, right? They, okay. they were still in the era of like licensed 
CD-ROMs of software. Right. And, and, and we kind of inoculated that company with this mentality of a, of a monthly licensing fee per user, per month, cloud delivery. And, and wow, that was amazing. Watching, watching that change in a company that big was mm. just phenomenal. Hmm. Nice. So then uh, at that point, they liked your technology. They liked kind of how to integrate it, you know, the SaaS, what it was. Um, was there anything else that, like from your perspective, so they saw some some key kind of integration or they saw the value of the product. From your perspective, what was your motivation and, and kind of the experience that you went through? Can you share a little bit more about that at the exit stage? Like, was it just a number made sense and you're like, or was it Autodesk? Was it, did they give you something that you'll continue working with them or you just wanted to move on to something else? And um, it, it was, it was, it was a few factors, right? I, I mean, of mm -hmm. course, of course you have a software giant like Autodesk come and approach you. That's, that's, there's definitely the wow factor there. Okay. Um, but, but like I said, I, I, I loved working in that domain. I love working in that engineering space. Mm. So, so that was a big factor. Um, yeah. I, and I think, I think we just jived with the people, right? The, the, their corporate culture is great. Um, the people from that team who, who took part in the acquisition. Um, and then of course, what later became my, um, my, um, uh, my boss at the company at Autodesk, they were just great guys. And, and we really, we really gelled. Um, cool. so, so the working relation, of course, the number made sense. Um, mm. and, and also at that point we were, we were kind of struggling to grow, right? We were still kind of growing organically. Um, we, we didn't, we didn't really look too much into like raising a proper big round. We were angel funded. Okay. Um, but we still owned 80, I think 80% of the company at that point of the nice. Autodesk acquisition. Yes. And, um, yeah, it, it was hard. It was hard getting new customers. It was a really long sales cycle mm -hmm. because to adopt PLM into an organization, you're, you're really changing the status quo. So exactly. you have to get huge teams on board, engineering, quality assurance, management. Um, so the sales cycles were, you know, six months to a year. Mm. It, it was brutal. Mm. So, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was time for a change. We, we were we were sort of feeling the fatigue of slogging through the mud, and uh, this kind of gave us a rebirth. Mm. Got it. So now your your exit from this. When was this? In two thousand? Like how how long ago was this? This was in two thousand twelve. Two thousand twelve. Okay. Yeah. And then I think that's when you also. At what point was there you saw that opportunity to start trial fire? Tell us a little bit from that, uh, you know, that exit. You probably had some time to kind of, you know, process that that experience. And then, you know, you, you drum up, say, okay, I'm, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I want to get back into the game. And do you see this problem so clearly? Or, or how, do you, how do you kind of move to that next stage of launching trial fire after that? So after about two years at Autodesk, um, mm -hmm. I, I, I think I just got too comfortable, <laughs> which is, which is a weird place to be. I never knew that about myself, right? It was sort of uh -huh. a, a little bit of a voyage of self-discovery, mm. but, um, it was a great job and I can't say enough good things about Autodesk, but you know, I spent a lot of time in meetings and, and, and I'm more of a doer mm. and, and I just, I, I, I guess I wasn't challenged enough. Um, sometimes you don't, appreciate the value of hardship until it's yeah. gone. And right. I know it sounds like, you know, I'm, I'm a sadomasochist and I like pain, but um, you, you kind of need that. You kind of need something to overcome. That's how you grow, right? Otherwise yeah, just, ex like, exactly. Stagnant. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And um, the idea of trial fire actually came about from uh, data stay, and then later at Autodesk, we saw a problem that actually was magnified as, as the company grew within mm. under the data state, under the Autodesk umbrella rather. And one thing we struggled with as part of the sales cycle at, at data state and then again later at Autodesk was, was understanding user behavior. Mm. You have a bunch of free trials going on. You have a SaaS product, you got a bunch of free trials. 
how do you know where the low hanging fruit is, right? How do you analyze user behavior and figure out, okay, these guys are engaged. So let's go after them. These guys, they're kind of just like poking around in the product. And there wasn't really a way to do that. Mm. Right. Um, Google Analytics, still the de facto standard for analytics. It's crap. Like, you know, you're going to see page views, anonymous users, everything is aggregated. You can't see individual customer journeys. Um, You can't ask the questions that you really need insight into. Mm. Um, And that's where the idea of trial fire was born. Got it. So you saw the problem so clearly. It was a problem at Autodesk. And then I know we mentioned you talked this uh, before our calls. You you actually partnered up with the same co-founder from your previous company, went out and launched Trialfire. Um, so maybe you could just tell me more, you know, tell us about more about, you know, data analytics specifically, because I think that's important for for a lot of our listeners who are in the SaaS space. Um, you know, what are, what is the time frame for analytics that you should be tracking? Um, what is the, the limit of the size of the company or what is the amount of data to be efficient that you should be tracking, um, you know, overall for if you're a SaaS company? <laughs> well, my philosophy has always been track everything. <laughs> the more, the better. Right. The more, the better. And that, that that's always been the, the trial fire philosophy as well. Mm. <clears throat> so that, that was one of our early differentiators is we out of the box tracked every single click, every single uh, keystroke, every single form field, scroll depth, everything. We figured, okay, let's get this fire hose of data and then we'll worry about how to make sense of it. Right. Because mm. trying to trying to trying to do it after the fact, yeah. you realize, oh wait, we didn't track that. So now you have to. You can't retroactively go back and track something, right? Right. So right. it's easy to retroactively ask the question as long as you have that data. Right. And then when you have that data, kind of presented to you, you can make better decisions because you're you're not you're not making assumptions that on on missing data, right? Now you can you don't have to go back and and see what what was missing and and make exactly. assumptions. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there like, so if you have all these data sets, right, is there anything specifically now that maybe as a SaaS company that you find to be most Im- important to, to track and specifically for generating growth and regarding on the customer behavior side? What are you seeing? You mentioned, you know, e-commerce stores, what are they tracking? What are they looking at? So, so tracking everything and, 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 and trying to be everything to everyone is sort of a double edged sword. Um, mm. Analytics mm-hmm. and in general, you know, MarTech, marketing tech, it's a huge space. Yeah. And it's a noisy space. So trying to be just another analytics player, we quickly realized, well, that's not going to work. Got it. Um, So, you know, you you have, of course, Google Analytics and you have uh, uh, enterprise versions of, of, of GA. You have the Adobe's of the world. You have IBM's. You have you know all the incumbents. So, so to stand out, we really focused on um, marketing data. So we started we started pulling down um, AdWords performance data, Facebook ads performance data, and and mashing it with our data. So now we're taking we're taking what you're spending on ads, right? mashing Mm -hmm. that into the customer journey Mm -hmm. and building an attribution solution. So Mm -hmm. now you're not, you know, the model for understanding if an ad is working or not working has been like, okay, well, what are the, what's the conversion rate? Okay. Mm -hmm. How many people clicked on this ad and bought, but it doesn't work like that anymore. It worked like that 10 years ago when you Googled something and then bought it. But now you, the way people shop online is completely different. They go on Facebook, they'll click an ad, then they'll watch a video on YouTube. Then maybe they'll subscribe to a newsletter and then mm-hmm. they'll get an email and then maybe you'll retarget them and then they'll buy. Exactly. So what all that journey and you're still giving credit to that retargeting ad that converted them, right? You're, you, you, you have to measure your entire funnel. Right. Um, and, and that's where we started tackling this uh, attribution problem because mm. uh, people were still doing it in, in a very archaic manner. They were using last click. They were using first and last click. They right. were saying, okay, well, wh- what if there's 10 clicks? Let's just divide it by 10. 
And, you know, th those heuristic models are completely arbitrary. They don't make sense. Right. So how do you kind of, uh, you know, track that? And how, how do you give that marketing attribution correctly? So you have 10 different, I think, what's the average? Now? I think it's like seven or nine kind of times you have to hit somebody with uh, exactly. some kind of marketing context. Like six and 11, <laughs> six and 11. Uh, marketing touches, around a dozen, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, on the high end that before someone converts. So, you, I mean, you basically have to be everywhere and then keep hitting them on different angles. And then where do you give, where do you suggest giving that attribution? Where is the right place to do it? So there's only one right way to do it. And actually the problem was solved back in the 60s by Lloyd Shapley, who mm. uh, won a Nobel Prize in mathematics for the Shapley value formula. And this is um, part of collaborative game theory. Mm. So, which is a, which is a branch of mathematics. So, so game collaborative game theory is all about how players play in a coalition, right? So mm -hmm. if you think about hockey, right, you have the guy that scores, but the guy that gets the assist also deserves some credit. So mm -hmm. um, the way I like to, the analogy I like to use is a card game. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's say we're playing a card game together. Okay. Me and you are playing. And we win a bunch of money. We're playing against the house. We're a team. Someone else joins our team. We win an even bigger pot. Mm. Someone else joins our team. We win an even bigger pot. How do we split fairly our total winnings? Mm. Okay. Is it, so, I mean, so one, one thing you mentioned could be equally, right? So one option is divided by the four of us, right? Right. Is, but it, just because it, you joined the team doesn't mean you did anything, Right. So how do we measure that? Well, mm. the way we do it is we look at your marginal contribution, right? Mm. So how did the team do before you? And then how did the team do after you, right? So if you, if you take that analogy and map it to the marketing world, the players are the touch points, mm -hmm. okay? So you have your Facebook, AdWords, email, those are all your touches. Mm -hmm. And the total pot, the winning, is your conversions, your sales. Mm-hmm. And you, you, you use the statistics. You don't try and attribute each individual sale. You mm -hmm. use the statistical, pro, uh, statistical performance of the different channels, how they work together as a coalition to create sales. And so would you give like a weight to each kind of, uh, I guess that's why you look at it, right? Like maybe you know, double the weight for the retargeting, maybe half the weight for you know, the initial piece of content they read. Is, but is it, it is, it, it, it's not weighted. That's the beauty mm. of it is you don't have to come up with arbitrary heuristics. The statistical performance mm. gives you the weighting. It's kind of like, it's kind of like a fancy weighted average. Got it. Yeah. The yeah. Weighting is based on the performance. Based on the data. So right. by this one person joining the team, if you're, if you're uh, winning streak, just automatically kind of started going, instead of increasing, you know, every game, by them joining it over time, their value increases. Yeah, so the, you know that they're mar that, that they're contributing marginally to, mm. and they're boosting your sales. They're providing lift. Nice. Um, so when it comes to data, I think one thing that's tricky is you know good data versus bad. I think that's that's always important. You want quality data to make better decisions, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do you guys, as you know, trial fire, or how do you suggest to people to make sure that they're what they gather is clean and verified? And then would you get, can you give an example between, you know, what's good and bad data for specifically marketing analytics that you see? Right. So, so, um, I'm sure you've seen that, like when you post links to, to a website somewhere and you want to measure the performance of those, you have to decorate those links with, uh, query parameters, UTM parameters, they call them. Yeah. Um, that's sort of, uh, the de facto standard is these UTM parameters. It, it, it came from the, the GA world. And mm -hmm. kind of almost every marketing uh, platform uses them today. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a way of putting some metadata on those links. And it's, it's just a matter of being regimented about building a scheme for um, maintaining those parameters and, and sort of the taxonomy of what they mean. If you have links coming in everywhere and... and, and mm you know, a link doesn't, doesn't have those parameters on it, then it just looks like, like direct traffic essentially. Mm -hmm. So that's the mm -hmm. first step. That was a bit of a learning experience for us that, you know, so many companies don't have their, uh, don't have their, their, their shit together in terms of like 
maintaining that, right? You need to have um, sort of a clean framework of how you're going to, like your taxonomy for your marketing needs to be clearly defined ahead of time. Mm. And so you do suggest that like same thing you mentioned, like, would you have that everywhere? Like, you know, you're, you're going on a podcast, you put a link there. Do you, um, you know, you absolutely. Put it there, everywhere. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. We, we stress that, like, do, don't put a link anywhere, anywhere mm. in the world, on the yeah. internet, in your email signature without those parameters. Right? Really? So that way, okay. you, that way, you know, what is driving traffic. Mm. And that's the Makes- start point. If you don't know where the traffic's coming from, then. Uh, you have no visibility. That's right. You can't give uh, proper attribution. Um, how do you do that as you scale, right? Because, uh, you know, as analytics, there's so much more data that you have to manage and you know, have to, as it grows, what's your guys' strategy for data analytics as you scale? And, you know, what's the system you, you, prov- you, you provide to organizations or suggest to them? So, so the scalability challenge for us um, was definitely prevalent. Um, mm. You know, if, if you think about a, a fairly decent uh, size organization with, with a lot of traffic and you're talking about capturing not just every page view, but every mm-hmm. single click mm-hmm. and every single um, keystroke, mm-hmm. then you have a lot of data. And initially, we just try to piggyback our scalability on... Um, a scalable data infrastructure. And we depended on Amazon to do that. So we're, mm. we were using, of course, like everyone else, we were using AWS, um, not like uh, uh, a server under my desk or anything, right? So mm-hmm. everything was on the cloud, but we, we, we started to um, just we were kind of drowning in the fees, right? Like, sure, we can turn up the scale and, and okay, we can, we can scale out and, and they make it really easy to do that, but it's also very costly. It get heads up pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. It adds up real quick. And, and we weren't, we weren't really getting the performance we wanted. Um, and a couple of years ago, we realized that we, we, we have to, we have to fix this because it's, mm. it's, it's eating too much of our, Eating, eating into too much of our profits. Mm. Um, the Amazon bill was just getting out of hand. And uh, we, we kind of had to, instead of using the, the, their data services, we kind of had to develop our own. It, it's still on Amazon, but now we have our own EC2 instances. We, we have very fine-grained control of the, the st- underlying storage devices that we're using. And... Um, we don't have like the fancy UI for like clicking and scaling things, but um, the cost is like, uh, I would say, you know, we were paying, uh, it's at least a tenth of what we were paying wow. before. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It's a 90% improvement. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. That's a yeah, much worth much worth trans- transition there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> cool. So Max, I want to kind of switch gears here, kind of make this a little bit more personal about kind of what your uh, kind of rapid fire type questions, but you don't even have to answer them rapid fire. Right. Um, so here's a question: You know, what what's one advice you would give your you know I'm saying 25 year old self, but let's say you know 10 years ago, say it's 2000. 10, 2012, let's, let's say around that range, you know, during that phase where you're building up your first startup, you know, before getting to an exit, any, any advice you'd give back to yourself? Um, or something you wish you had known, just like if you, if you, you know, for, for business. Yeah, or you I, tell I, I, I wish that I, I was better at, um, developing a sales and marketing, uh, program, right? Mm. That was always the, like for me developing the software. Again, I'm on the tech side of things, but mm-hmm. as, as a co-founder, you got to wear many hats and it, and right. I really wish that I focused more on sales and marketing and developing sales assets quicker, uh, more robust sales assets so that you can arm a sales team. You would have done that. So you're more of a technical mm-hmm. founder, right? You're a CTO. Mm-hmm. Do you feel you, you, that would have been a good fit though. I mean, not playing to your strengths rather than, you know, having, you know, uh, say your, your co-founder being that being his strength um, versus you trying to develop and learn how to do that. 
or is it just because you I, want it to be more kind of? I think uh, you have to. I didn't. I didn't really mm. have a choice, and I mm. and I kind of um, didn't put as much emphasis on that mm. as I needed to, and especially now, like you know, as we were as we talked about earlier, you know, SaaS and cloud. It's 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 how everything is delivered now, right? And it's right. it's very hard to differentiate differentiate yourself on features now. Yeah, nobody cares yeah. about features, right? So right. You, you really have to resonate with customers, and mm. um, yeah, I, I think I've gotten a lot better at that, but but maybe grudgingly. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Yeah, so, sure. so there, there's definitely an, an, an importance in not just building features, but but really understanding product market fit and mm. and how to how to deliver uh, a message that resonates with your potential customers. Mm. And what would you say are some of the challenges you're you're facing today in terms of growing and, and continue to scale Trailfire? Well, I alluded to some of them earlier, like the the just the size of the marketing tech space is is mm. just huge, and it's very very noisy, right? Like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, if you if you try and search like how to be successful with digital marketing, you'll get inundated with videos and and tips and blogs and well, what software should it like? There's a million options for um, marketing automation and. Uh, email and and this and that and customer journey so right we, we the, the the challenge was really finding a niche because trying mm. to be an analytics tool mm-hmm. no that's not that that's not working mm. um so so we we had to pivot a couple times and and i think we nailed it because the the attribution challenge is real mm-hmm. right if, if you can't figure out um how to how to measure your return on ad spend correctly, then mm-hmm. you don't know what levers to turn up or down. You don't know which bucket to put your money in. Exactly. So, um, you know, you have, you have these companies and they're spending tens of thousands of dollars monthly on ads mm-hmm. and, and, and they're burning money in a lot of cases. Right. Yeah. So, so, so kind of fine tuning, fine tuning on, on, a being as specific as possible. And getting that niche right, I'd say, is, is the most important thing. Nice. So speaking about attribution, um, you know, you do it with marketing. On a personal level, would you say there are any, you know, books, mentors, people you follow, you know, maybe three of them who you, you say have been instrumental to your success over the last few years that you can give credit to? <laughs> um, I, I to, be, to be honest, mm-hmm. I haven't really read any kind of marketing books. I mean, all the books I've read have been... Uh, technical. So, mm. um, things like the mythical man month is, okay. is sort of the Bible of software development. Uh, mm. people wear how to manage technical teams, uh, clean code, mm-hmm. which is how to develop clean, robust, maintainable software. Th- cool. Those are the kind of things that, that I would attribute a lot of our success to. Nice, nice. Um, and speaking of success, so you know, you mentioned mentioned that, and then you know, somebody who's also got an exit from from your first company. I think you know a lot of SaaS founders go into building a company with the goal of you know success being getting an exit. Um, you know, now a couple of years later, what does success mean to you d- today? Whether that's personally, financially, mm-hmm. um, you know, business doesn't matter. So I I, I think trying to trying to build a company for an exit is, is a horrible strategy. <laughs> I, I think you need to build value mm-hmm. and then the exit will come. Yeah. Right. So if you okay. can build something that's valuable to people, if you can create value, if you can, if it's disruptive, even better, mm-hmm. but if you can create value and if you can solve a real problem for people, then that's what you should be aiming for. Right. Right. Mm. And then if you grow that, if you scale that, if you get attention, then then the exit will come. Right. So what what does success mean to you? I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, that exit isn't uh, your main tracking point of, of success. Or? I mean, it's, it, it's it, of course, it's something I think about and I think mm-hmm. about, well, who, who would be a potential acquirer and how would I get their attention? But mm. first, first and foremost, it's, it's, yeah, it's about, it's about getting customers. So mm. um, definitely success for me w- would be a successful exit. Nice. Um, but, 
if I can get if I can get the attention of potential acquirers and even begin that dialogue with them, then that's success. If I can add 10 more customers in the next quarter, then that's success. Nice. Love it. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so Max, going into 2021 here, uh, what are your future plans for, for Trial Fire and where can the audience get in touch with you if they want to learn more about what you're working on? So uh, the plan again is to focus in on attribution. I think I think that's going to be our bread and butter moving forward. I think we made several different pivots, and and I think this is the one that's going to stick. Mm. Um, we're, we're we're we've we've come up with a with a message and a solution that really resonates with customers, and and they've been able to really change the way they do things and and, and disrupt their status quo. Mm -hmm. um, so it's working. Um, and our plan for 2021 is just more of the same is to sort of fine tune our marketing message around attribution and keep, nice. keep going after it. Uh, definitely scaling out our sales team mm -hmm. is, is, is on the, is on the agenda for 2021. And, uh, if you want to get in touch with me, it's max at trialfire.com and, uh, you can hit us up on the website. Cool. Awesome. We'll add those links to our show notes if people want to check that out. All right. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much for jumping on SaaS District today, Max. Appreciate it. My pleasure. All right. Have a good one. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you all for watching this episode and joining SaaS District today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell for future episodes where we interview top leaders in the SaaS industry. If you're a SaaS company looking to grow and unlock the true value of your business, get in touch with us at Horizon Capital and myself or one of our consultants will provide a free assessment to help you get there and hit your goals. If you have any feedback or suggestions for this podcast, please comment down below and help us improve our content for you all. Thanks again and see you on the next one.